You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have a really special guest. Uh, We're heading back to the New River. You guys wanted me to really branch out, and I'm trying to hit every major waterway really in our surrounding area. And we have we have one of the legends down in the New River, Ethan. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a long time coming, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I'm looking forward to it, and, and thanks for the invitation to be on your podcast. No, no, no problem at all. Um, I mean, really, as always with the show, like what got you into this, especially in the New River? I mean, I've always said like that's like Jurassic Park. I mean, the James River is considered like Virginia's river, but then you have this thing in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it's, it's a freaking cool place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just grew up fishing, um, grew up fishing with Nolan Miner, who's been a guest on your podcast. And then, Once uh, or twice. yeah, yeah. Went to school down here at Virginia tech, you know, which oh. I, I still live in Blacksburg, you know, it's only about 30 minutes from the new river and, uh, started working for Britton Lee Stoudemire who, who owned new river outdoor company. This is actually our 20th year in operation. And I, uh, yeah, yeah. I started working for them kind of as a college student over the summers and weekends. And then since I've graduated college, I've just, this has become my full-time gig. I'm the lead guide with the outfit now. So it just has been a really fun and kind of really learning experience over the last few years here. How did you graduate from college and be like, this is I want to get hooked up with doing float trips on a river. Like how did that story unfold? Well, I already did it when I was in college, just kind of more as a, in a part-time role, you know, I helped them out during my summer breaks and a few times like on weekends, you know, and I graduated college in 2020 and just kind of thought to myself like, Hey, this is, I have so much fun doing this. Um, It's a good situation to be in. So I've just rolled with it from there. Most people in the industry, when they want to get into fishing, it's doing the tournament scene or the content creation. Did, did you ever think about even like, I believe tech does have a really good fishing team. Was that something that ever crossed your mind? I was uh, the president of the Bass Fishing Club at Tech. Holy I shit, was, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on the team all four years. I was a president by my senior year. Um, yeah, so I fished the college series all, all four years. Yeah, that was something. That was my main extracurricular when I was in school for sure. Dude, that's freaking awesome. Did you have your own boat or did you steal a friend's boat? How did that all work for tech? No, no, I uh, didn't have my own boat. I was a co-angler all four years. I fished one year with Tyler Heupel, who has also been a guest on your podcast. Um, I fished kind of the other three years with my my friend Junior Roberts. But yeah, um, you had to have your own boat at tech. Mm. Um, And we actually were able to do pretty well, you know, not necessarily everybody that was a boater for the tournaments had their own boat it was a lot of like hey my dad has a boat and lives at smith mountain lake and i can use it for the weekend you know so we actually had a pretty good you know most of our club tournaments while i was in school would have 12 13 14 boats and then we'd usually send about 10 to the to the big tournaments you know that's insane. It's also to me, it's fascinating. After I got done with college fishing and I started doing this, how tight this community is where I run into Tyler or, or, or Nolan and be like, oh, like we're all kind of connected in some way, shape or form. It's just, I don't know. It's just fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. With, with that said, with your college experience, when the next step came, did you think about pursuing more tournaments or was it in college you knew that you wanted to go straight into guiding? Um. I didn't really, really know what I wanted to do. You know, obviously my degree was in national security and foreign affairs. So I was kind of looking into that field and I graduated in 2020 when COVID just kind of had everything kind of so strange. So I, uh, I graduated in 2020 and kind of thought I'd guide through the rest of the 2020 season and then kind of figure out what I was going to do. But I think kind of that year after school ended and it, became my full-time job for a while. I was like, I just love this so much. And it was kind of a uh, good opportunity. You know, Britt Stoudemire, who's a legend down here who owns the outfit, you know, he still does a few guide trips, but he's kind of 
doing less and less God trips. So it kind of worked for me to come in and do more and more God trips, you know, so it just kind of was a perfect storm, you know, and it's ended up really well. Yeah. Brett's one that he's on my bucket list too. I might have to go down there actually make a, make a week <laughs> trip uh, to get him on the podcast with, and, and don't worry guys, we're going to get into the river too. This, I think this is fascinating because you got to tour the country than fishing college. Did, was that like a completely different world or could you take the skill sets on home bodies water like Smith and the new river? And is, did that translate anywhere else? Um, well, we were kind of fortunate to where, you know, now it's major league fishing back, back when I was in school, it was the FLW. FLW college series. They came to Smith mountain every year. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was a really easy one for us to hit. Um, but yeah, I, I, cause, cause it was go- regions back then too. It Shit, was regions. I, yeah. So, I mean, that's where my yeah. stuff is from college is it was like three tournaments for our area. One year they went to Ohio for some damn reason, but you they <laughs> usually have Smith to begin with a title fishery and then they go up North. Yeah. Damn. That's pretty yeah. good. Memories. Yeah. We never traveled or I never traveled too, too far. Um, it was just kind of hard at tech, you know, cause we were not a varsity sport, you know, so we couldn't really get that much time excused out of class, you know? So we would just try to really focus on two or three tournaments a year that were the closest to us, you know. So our team would really focus on the tournament at Smith. Um, For a couple years, Bass went to Cherokee Lake, which is three hours from us, you know. So we would just kind of real focus on the ones near us. I mean, I went to some up in New York, South Carolina. But, yeah, yeah, we kind of stayed kind of regional. That's still, that's still really cool. It does give you those experiences. Um, yeah. And Smith is just such an interesting place because you have the Roanoke system, you have the new there as well. And, and, and really, I think that kind of like does transition a little bit into the river that you guide on the, the Susquehanna. And I saw, I was going to bring that up. I saw Nolan's freaking like, th- not throwing shade, but like not a lot of people signed up. It looked like compared to the Susquehanna tournament to, to mm-hmm. basically give everyone a cliff note that's listening to the podcast. I think it's interesting because I had the last time the, uh, the last time I talked about the new river, we, we talked about the difference between Susquehanna, the new, how many people are actually going to be showing up to this thing. I think this place is going to show off really well. But with that said, if you're an outsider, you might not know a lot about the new and Susquehanna is a big time darling, especially for guiding. Why did you settle on guiding here in the new and you still do versus all the other opportunities? Um, I just love fishing here at the new, I, I think the new river just has the biggest river smallmouth on the East coast. I mean, the Susquehanna has some real nice fish. I have a lot of clients who fish every year at the new and every year at the Susquehanna. And they say without a doubt, like the bigger, the biggest fish are at the new, you know, like Nolan won that Hobie BOS last year on the Susquehanna and never, never had a 20 incher either mm-hmm. day, you know, and that is not going to happen here at the new, I think, I think a lot of people are really going to kind of enjoy seeing these bags that people catch at the new, because I think you're going to have a lot of bags that are like 14 inch or 14 and a half inch or 15 inch or 22 and a half inch or, you know, it's like, there's just some monsters here on the new and, the Susquehanna, I think what sets it apart is just the sheer number of 16, 17, 18, 19 inches. I mean, that I think is just kind of untouchable how many of those size class are up there. But I think if we're talking about like five pound plus, 20 inch plus smallmouth, I think the new is, is the champ there. By the time this episode comes out, guys, the the Susquehanna Fishing Report had a drop with Jake Harshman, who's one of Jeff Little's friends, and we talked even more about this upcoming tournament, and I put a bet out with him that I think there's going to be a six-pounder caught, something like that, just a freak. I mean, this place, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm not as big into the, the kayaking world as maybe you or, or Nolan or other people watching, there hasn't been a big event here, and usually it seems like the first time a big event goes somewhere, it's some freaking crazy numbers when something first gets there. And I think it'll, I think if they come back next year to the new, then you're going to see a spike in numbers because people are going to see the dinosaurs that can come, come out of here. Yeah. Yeah. A six pounder. 
in this time of year. I'm, like I might lose does. that bet. I might lose that yeah. bet. But so I, I always tell people, I mean, we catch big long fish all summer. And I'm like, this fish would have been a six pounder in March, you know, but they're usually, they weigh a little less this time of year, but I have no doubts. You'll see 21 inches, 22 inches, maybe even a 23 incher, um, weighed in or measured in, which is just insane to think about, you know, I mean, a 23 inch smallmouth is just it's insane. I enormous. mean, even, even when you go up North, you know, I went up to Lake Erie this spring and, and we caught a few six pounders, but they were only about 21 inches, you know, and we've caught, you know, a few 23 inches gotten on the new through the years. So, I mean, that's just a, a huge old dinosaur of a fish. Why do you think the fish are so different? Um, I think we just have a longer growing season than the Susquehanna. Um, you know, obviously we're probably just a little bit warmer down here. Um, the forage base of the river seems to be incredible. I mean, we get just these huge, big, like, like mean six, seven inch crawfish, like, like rusty crawfish. Oh, uh, well, we have the new river crawfish. We have rusty crawfish. <laughs> we have a few different species, but back when I was in school, me and my friends just about every year would, would go to the river and flip a bunch of rocks and have a, have a crawfish boil. And our rule of thumb was you shouldn't get one that wasn't bigger than your hand, like from your wrist to the tip of your middle finger. That's a lobster. So, yeah. <laughs> and every now and again, you'll catch a big fish and it just has some huge old claws coming out of it. So, oh yeah, gosh. I think just the forage base on the river is really good. Long growing season. Um, All right. Yeah, gotta, good regulations. I got to find this thing because let me see if I get this up here. <laughs> New River Crawfish. Yeah, those things are freaking massive. Good yeah. lord. Yeah, they're big. Huh. That's interesting. That's really interesting. What, with that with that stated with the, the forage species that are there, could you do a little compare and contrast between, because again, for better or worse, it's going to be compared to the Susquehanna. It just is. Um, and, and you mentioned it a little bit, but I want you to, just to reiterate it for our, to our listeners. Susquehanna, the new one is extremely wide. Um, it's been the media darling forever, but the new river, I, I, one thing I think is access points, possibly it is a big distinguisher compared to Susquehanna, which maybe has a little bit more access points. Is that, is that a fair assessment or is that way off? Um, I think the new river has absolutely plenty of access points. It is never really an issue of access on our part. Um, you know, a lot of the float trips we do in a day are about seven or eight miles. And we'll usually actually float past another ramp, you know, within our seven or eight miles. It seems like there's a ramp just about every three or four miles um, for most of the river. So access is pretty good. But one thing that I think is different is you just have big rapids that kind of separate the pools you know you have some impassable class three well i mean passable for us in the rafts but impassable for john boats and jet boats you know big class three rapids that kind of if you come in a jet boat or a kayak you have to kind of be smart about where you choose to put in because there there's a lot of areas where you don't have a lot of um you can't cover much distance you know without running into a big rapid. And I, I'm really glad you brought that up. Uh, so many people that follow my show want me to do more New River coverage because they don't know anything about it. And, and the one thing I tell them, it's it's not like the Shenandoah or the, up, or the Upper James where it's just this calm, meandering, slow-moving body of water. There's a ton of areas that you could get into some trouble if you think you could just yeet it in the kayak you bought from Dick's Sporting Goods. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing too, I, I I believe I could be mistaken. The the river, it flows completely differently. It flows from south to north, and it's really separated between the above Clater Lake and then below Clater Lake. Correct. 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 So what we do and what I have the most experience on is from the Clater Lake Dam to the West Virginia State Border. So that's about sixty five miles of river that we do most of our guiding on. Um, I've been 
on the above Claytor Lake section, and I've been in some of the West Virginia sections, but most of my experience comes in that 65 miles between Claytor Lake and the West Virginia state line. What is it about that section that you prefer? Um, well, that's just kind of where we are located, but also that section just the ecosystem is a lot bigger below Claytor Lake than above Claytor Lake. Um, a lot of creeks flow in into Claytor Lake. So usually what you'll see is um, there's just a lot more water, a lot bigger of an ecosystem below Claytor Lake. A lot of the bigger fish come from below Claytor Lake. I think the numbers are better below Claytor Lake. And hmm. then just there's just no lack of good habitat from Claytor Lake to the West Virginia border. And uh, stretches of West Virginia are really good. Um, I mean, I've there's we've had experiences catching a lot of nice fish there. I think that area of the river is harder to fish. The the river almost gets like too big down there. Hmm. It's just real big, real deep, real fast. A lot of your eddies down there are in like 15 feet compared to six, seven feet, which just Damn. Sounds like it would be good, but not. It, it's just too much water almost. And uh, I think the regulations are better in Virginia. We have a 12 to 22 inch protected slot limit in the Virginia portions. I think you, in the West Virginia portions, you get a lot less catch and release. A lot of people catch and keep their fish, um, which for river smallmouth is kind of brutal because like an 18 inch or is usually about eight years old. So if you're pulling too many of those out of the river, it's just catastrophic kind of on the, on the population structure. That, that is really interesting when you talked about below the dam, because I, I would want to know if this factors into a pattern or your day out on the water is water being drawn from the lake. Um, I do not know much about Claytor Lakes Dam. Is it hydroelectric? Is it, is it a flood based, flood based lake like car is, or is it a little bit of both? It's hydroelectric. Um, yeah, so that is a huge part of what we do. And I would put, not to brag on us and our guides, but I would put our guides against everybody at being able to read the river conditions. So most days I don't even, I have not chosen what stretch of river we're going to do until the morning when I wake up and I go and I check the U.S. Geological Service gauges. They got one up at Radford at the Claytor Lake Dam. And then they have one downriver closer to the West Virginia border. And uh, then a lot of the tributary creeks have their own um, geological service gauges. And then just kind of having done this for a while, you know, like there's a few stretches of river that just get brutalized by west wind, you know. So if it's the west wind, kind of those stretches are out. There's some stretches that have really high mountain sides that are kind of protected from the wind that I like to go to on windy days. But uh, like here in the last week, we've had just some crazy, crazy afternoon and late night thunderstorms with like really heavy, but really localized rain. So a lot of the creek systems around here are getting hit by about an inch and a half of rain overnight, but the main river stem is not. So you're, you're, right now we're kind of dealing with the main river is clear, but a lot of creeks pushing in are pushing in a lot of mud, you know. So if you don't know how to read the gauges and read the rainfall totals, you might end, you might end up putting in right under a creek that's really muddy, you know, and be dealing with muddy water all day. So just understanding how to read the gauges, how to read the water level, how to read the weather is just that's where I feel like I'm becoming a better guide almost, you know, every year, you know, understanding how certain conditions affect certain stretches of the river. It's a science. I mean, being a Shenandoah river boy my whole life, it, it's so important to be able to read your gauges and know the flow rates and, and what is safe and how, you know, at each step of the way, as the gauge goes up or down, you know how those fish relocate. Uh, and with that being said, ballpark numbers, what are, normal flow flow rates this time of year uh on the new river below the dam um for about this time of year i would say below the dam you're you're usually looking at 
two to 3,000 cubic feet per second. Um, right now, we're at about 4,500, which is totally fine. Um, the springtime, it's nothing to go out in six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 cubic feet per second. Um, yeah, it's a lot of water. The fish just set up differently. Um, yeah. How, so it's how do just, you float that? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it, it goes pretty fast. Yeah, but uh, that's one thing about the New River. Like I grew up fishing the Shenandoah River a, a little bit, you know, being from Charlottesville, fish the Shenandoah, the Rivanna, the New River. Just even in the summer when the flows are pretty low, it just has a harder push to it than a lot of your other rivers in Virginia, which kind of makes makes the raft like the raft like we got out of one probably the best vessel, you know, to fish it in. A lot of kayak fishermen I've seen struggle because their anchor system isn't really up to to par, you know. They can't hold on bottom or they try to drop their anchor in too much current and their boat starts hitting this number, you know, or, you know, they're trying to throw, they're trying to go down the bank throwing a spinner bait or something, you know, but they're going too fast, you know. They're, they're 50 yards down river by the time they retrieve their cast, you know? So the, the raft is a really comfortable thing to fish out of. I'm on the oars, slowing the boat down. I got about a 50 pound anchor, you know, that sits us down really well if we need to. So that's kind of what makes the raft so good. But yeah, I mean, it just, I fished in as low as 800 cubic feet per second. And I fished in as hmm. high as 12,000 cubic feet per second. So it just, you can fish all the, all kinds of levels and the fish just set up differently, you know, on the different levels. Yeah. And you can, you can catch them in so many different conditions. I, I think something that's interesting, what you said, is just the eddy size and what you're dealing with. Cause you know, I mean, we've been using the Shenandoah as an example. I mean, an eddy there is probably like a pebble size compared to what you're dealing with. And it's, it's so much harder to efficiently work that eddy. Like you said, when, with the competitors and, and we can kind of merge this a little bit together here with the kayak tournament coming up and I just creeped on my phone. I think Nolan said there's like 72 that are signed mm -hmm. up right now. So two parts of this would be like, how much, what do you think the inches are to cut a check? And then is this place going to be fishing big or are people going to be on top of each other? Um, I was surprised there were only 72 entries. Um, I, so I think people are not going to be fishing on top of each other too bad. I think the some of the more famous kind of honey holes on the new are actually off limits for this tournament. They are too far past the upstream limit. So I think that will kind of spread people out. Um, I don't think people will, will really be fishing on top of each other. Um, this time of year on the new... I mean, my favorite time to guide is the springtime, the pre-spawn, March, April, May. Um, I mean, we've had days where we've had 101 inch, 102 inch, 103 inch, almost, I think our 105 inch days, you know, in the pre-spawn. I think this time of year, it's going to look, I think we'll get a lot of funny bags where people are catching 14 and 15 inches and then they'll lay into like a 22 inch, you know. Um, this time of year, guiding, just you, we want to, we're going through a lot of fish. We're trying to catch a lot of fish. And if you could catch maybe four or five fish above 16, 17 inches, you know, that's kind of what you're looking for. Um, I think somebody will get on something that, that sets them at about 90 inches a day. And I think if you can look at about 90 inches a day, that's what I would predict to be probably top five. I'd say maybe 80 inches a day would cut you a check, but I don't know. I mean, it, there's just some behemoths out there, you know, and I think somebody, I mean, almost like, almost like the Florida tournaments for largemouth, you know, if somebody can just have a good baseline with three or four, 16, 17 inches, and then find themselves a 23 incher, you know, that'd be a big bag. So. Yeah, so I just did some quick mathity maths on Nolan's term at the Susquehanna. So 187.75 inches, so divide that by 10. So he was averaging 18.75 inches per fish that he caught. So, yeah, so it sounds like this place could potentially blow blow out the Susky win that he had last year for, for the winner. 
It could. It could. I like I said earlier, like Nolan seemed to be catching like cookie cutters, like mm-hmm. like 18 and a half to 19 and a half. And he won the tournament and didn't catch a 20 incher. Oh, and I there are going to be so many 20 inches caught in this tournament, you know. But I think your baseline fish is going to be more like 16, 17 inches instead of like 18 inches on the Susquehanna. So I think like the average fish weighed in will be smaller, but the the, the top line yeah. fish will be bigger. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that makes sense. And then it'd be whether if somebody actually like cracks five twenties or something like ludicrous like that, which could it happen? No. If it does happen, would it help for marketing for you and your business? Probably. Probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I've had, I mean, we've had, uh, I had two days this spring where we caught five twenty inches, but that's the springtime, not the summertime. But, uh, the fish are definitely there, you know, they're just harder to catch in the summer. It's kind of like we're a week away from the tournament, and I don't really know what the water conditions are going to be like for the tournament. We've just been – I mean, there was hardly any rain in the forecast this week, and it's rained about three inches at my house this week. So there's not really hardly any rain in the forecast for next week, but I don't know if that's actually going to happen or not. So, I mean, I still think we're a week out, and there are so many different uh, strategies that could play at this tournament, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. You know, you, you mentioned earlier, like the, the, the community holes being the first time that anyone's being here from a tournament standpoint, like just in general, like how much do community holes play? For example, is if you go to the Potomac river, there's been about a hundred thousand tournaments over the past 200 years there, you know, the, everyone knows the community holes it's on the Bassmaster, but for the new it, it, to me, to me, it seems like they wouldn't play as much because no one, a lot of people wouldn't know about them. Yeah, I think that's true. I think, and I don't have really the information to back this up, but some of the community holes on the new are very small areas. And I, I, maybe they did this, maybe they didn't, but I think they made some of those areas off limits because I think they were looking at a situation where 50 of the 72, you know, kayaks would have found out about the same little two mile stretch of river and they'd have been sitting there. But, uh, I mean, I think community holes will play a little bit. I mean, there's a few little spots that are in the in the tournament boundaries that that have a little bit of notoriety, you know. So I think they might play a little bit. But I I think the people that should are really looking to win the tournament should kind of look off the beaten trail. Um, fishing pressure is just a big thing here on the new. Um, really. Yeah, yeah. It's just like it's not as big as the Susquehanna, you know, so it can't support that amount of fishing pressure. Um, <clears throat> this time of year seems to have the most fishing pressure. Um, I've been catching a lot of fish guiding recently that you can tell they've been caught in the past couple of weeks, you know, have the have the hole in their mouth. Um, so I have a few stretches for guiding that I love guiding this time of year because they're way off the beaten path not much fishing pressure, real big rapids through the section, which keeps a lot of kayakers and, and John boaters off that stretch, you know? So I think people that are looking to do the best should honestly look for areas where fishing pressure is the lowest. Is, is fishing pressure relative? Because it feels like the new rivers fishing pressure is not, is a little different than like the main stem of the Shenandoah where it's like that place gets abused, like a $20 prostitute. Like there's so many people on that thing. Like it is the fishing pressure, generally speaking on the new, is it comparable to other rivers in Virginia or is it considerably less because it is so isolated from Richmond and Washington, DC and places like that? Um, I would say there's probably a little bit less pressure, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Fishing pressure is probably pretty relative. You know, we probably have less fishing pressure than you guys, but from me as a guide, you know, mm-hmm. I'm seeing any sort of fishing pressure. Well, that's your like, reality. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'd say, I'd say we probably have less fishing pressure than those places, but there are, I mean, there's a lot of people that get out on the river here, you know, like the kayak boom that's happened kind of all across the country, definitely still happening here. Um, what just kind of makes me sick 
And this week, this is opening kind of a whole bag of worms. But you just see a lot of people on the New River, and they find a spot. You know, they find a good spot. And then they fish that one spot until there are no fish there and there are no new fish moving in. You know, like I see, I see I'll see like the same kayak on the river sitting at the same spot, you know, for eight months, you know, and then all of a sudden I never see him there anymore. And I'll be like, oh, I'll go try that spot. Nothing, you know. So I think a lot of people here kind of find a spot, fish it out and then find their next spot, which is. I mean, to each their own, but yeah, I think the, the fishing pressure here is, is not, it's not proportional all throughout the river. You know, some areas just get beat to death harder than others, you know, areas that are closer to uh, some of the bigger population centers around here. And then there's some areas that have kind of some notoriety on the internet, you know, but uh, yeah, but honestly, one thing about the new is I hardly see anybody before Memorial Day and after Labor Day. You know, it seems like all the fishing pressure is from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Like I going out on my guide trips in March and April, and it could be a beautiful, like 75 degree sunny April day, you know, and it's like nobody out there. And it's just, I think, because the water stays cold here pretty late into the year. It gets cold early. You know, like when the water gets gets too cold for the kayakers to want to get out in the water that's what i was gonna say that's what yeah how how much of it is kayakers compared to jet boaters and and people floating um a lot of it's kayakers um a lot of it is like little jet boats i would say the amount of people that have like really kind of efficient fishing rigs here like either really decked out rafts like mine or really big you know 17 18 19 foot jet boats is actually pretty low you know so Hmm. um high during high water conditions or during the colder months you you see hardly any fishing pressure you know but in the summer when the flows level out the water gets warm that's when you see a lot of pressure and in the comment section, will we'll check me on this, but that's the issue, you know, where I grew up is I like fishing in the wintertime because there's no one out there. Because I think 60 to 70% of the traffic are kayakers and people floating on tubes. And yeah. you're right. Once those major summer holidays hit, dude, it's a pain in the ass. Um, yeah. I, I fished a tournament in the Shenandoah and I had to calculate it. And it's like, well, if it's a Saturday, there could be people floating. And this part of the river, uh, I think it's like near Watermelon Park, you couldn't make a cast without hooking someone because of how many yeah. people will float it. And it's just, it's stupid things like that you have to factor in uh, to your day. And I was just doing a tournament for fun. I'm not trying to make a living like you. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's definitely certain sections that I don't do on the weekends in the summer. You know, I just know it's going to be too many people. Um, but, you know, so it's easy as a guide to get real life. But these people are just trying to have fun just like you are. You know, it's a public waterway. You know, I mean, I'm just glad that people are getting out, coming to our area, enjoying the new river. You know, I mean, even if a little bit of elevated fishing pressure makes things a little tougher on me, you know, so be it. I mean, at least people are getting out, enjoying being out here, you know. And like I said, I have nine months of the year where I hardly see anybody else out on the river, you know. So, yeah. When, when I think of the new river, it's always comes to mind first is this was ground zero or one of the places for the muskie craze. And, and I feel like it gets overshadowed that the state record smallmouth came out of there. Are, do people look at the new river in your circles? Is it, is it musky first and, and smallmouth are kind of like a secondary thing or, or, or is it compatible? Like what is the primary fish species people think of when they think of the new? I'd say probably smallmouth. I mean, I'd say actually the, I don't have the numbers. The Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources kind of recently did like an angler survey on the new. And I want to say 70 some percent of people said they primarily target smallmouth. 20 some said they primarily target musky. Hmm. A lot of guys around here are like just musky guys. You know, they just go after musky and that's just about it, you know. But I'd say there are more bass fishermen than musky fishermen, certainly around Hmm. here. That is interesting. It just like the musky guys just must be the most vocal. That's probably what it is. Yeah. Well, it's a really tight community, 
you yes. know, I mean, a lot of people, you know, kind of your weekend warrior type anglers. I mean, some of them might be musky fishermen, but for a fish that takes so much kind of effort, and patience, you know, if you just kind of have one day off a week that you want to go fish, you know, I think a lot of people would rather fish for smallmouth and catch a bunch, you know, um, than kind of try to get that one musky bite. So I, I'd be remiss every time we talk about the new, or if I'm talking to a biologist, I bring this up where it comes to the flathead situation, um, which if you, the upper Potomac has a problem with it, the Susquehanna has a flathead <laughs> situation, but every time it's brought up, the new river has flathead and the world's not burning. My common section is not threatening to kill me. Why the hell is it? The new river can have this kumbaya stuff where everything can live and you, I just like to bring this up to any of my new river guys. Do you have a thought on like why it works there? I don't really. Um, I think, I think, and I might be wrong, but I think they're native to the new river. Um, I think they've yeah, always they been they here. Yeah. They've always been here. Always kind of been part of the ecosystem. We'll catch a few occasionally. Like usually I might catch like two or three in a guide season. Um, but yeah, I mean, they just don't seem to be exploding like they are in other places. You know, I think, I mean, are, are do you know if, are they native to the James and the, no, no, they're, they're not. And, and it's, it's just a question I ask everyone because the biologists that I've had on, on the show have always said like they are native to the new and that's why it works there. And then I ask, well, why does it work there? And it's just cause, just cause they're native. And it's like, so why can't we duplicate those conditions at the Susky or the upper Potomac? So that way we can have big small mouth at, you know, that don't have bite marks all over them yeah. and nobody knows. And so I just think it's so unique that our, our answer is cause it's native. And it's like, well, that's a bullshit cop out answer. Could we go a little farther? Cause yeah. Well, like, I I'm think, the, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go for it. No, you go for it. I think this might be like a confusing analogy. If you think of like an ecosystem is like a pie, you know, like right now in the new, you know, everything is kind of kumbaya, like you said, but when a new species gets introduced to a new ecosystem, you know, like the flatheads coming into the James are taking away a slice of pie from something that was already there. You know, it's like you start getting like, you know, so I don't know. I just think, They've been here. They've always been here. They haven't always been at the James. So something, I mean, like some, they have to come at some things. Um, yeah. You know, they, some, something has to suffer for, for a new thing to be introduced into the ecosystem. Yeah. The only other thing I could hypothesize is it's because of the dam and it's something about the water runs colder, maybe in the new, that's the only maybe. other thing I can hypothesize on that. Um, yeah. because I know what the upper Potomac do, man, it's bad in some sections where they were reduced. I mean, there's like, I've seen, you know, 13 inch smallmouth just down a flathead's throat. And I don't think I truly appreciated how voracious of predators those suckers are. Yeah. Well, I think, I think a comparable, a comparable comparison is, uh, the muskies here on the new river, you know, they're not native. They were stocked. A lot of people that fished here before the muskies say that the smallmouth fishing used to be better. They say the large mouth fishing on the new used to be incredible, which now there's hardly any, they say the brim fishing, you know, rock bass, pumpkin seed, bluegill used to be really good. Now there's hardly any. Um, so, you know, I just kind of think the muskie, fishing may have affected that kind of just like how now the flatheads are affecting the fishing on the James and the Shenandoah. Possibly. Yeah, I, I could see that. I mean, I, I don't think a muskie, I just don't think eats as much as people. I think it's because it's big. People just jump to the conclusion two plus two is four. And if it's big, it eats a lot, but it's like a flathead is a freaking dumpster. It will eat yeah. way more than I think a mus muskie will. And I just don't yeah. think a ecosystem ever will get overpopulated with muskie like catfish will. Yeah. Generally yeah. Speaking. I agree to an extent. There's stretches of this new river that have so many musky though, that it might really? kind of change your perception if you came there, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's a certain pool here on the new that is like four miles of just super slow water, like almost like a lake. And that's where a lot of the musky fishermen fish. And, uh, there are so many muskies in there. 
And a lot of the locals around here will tell you that that was one of the best largemouth fisheries in Virginia before hmm. the muskies came in. And they said there used to be so many sunfish in that hole and so many largemouth. And now it is kind of just muskies in there. Like the smallmouth fishermen don't fish there. You know, it's almost just muskies in that hole now. That's fascinating. That is really, really cool. I didn't know that. Because you guys also have that like walleye strain that's found nowhere else in the world, right? Yeah, most of that. There are walleyes on our stretch of river, but most of the walleyes spend a lot of the year in Clater Lake and then go up the river above Clater Lake to spawn. So, so we don't see too yeah. many walleyes in our area below the dam. So I'm dyslexic. So up is south, right? Up so is south. Is here. up, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So most of the walleyes are south of the lake which is upstream of the lake but yeah yeah do you fish clear lake at all because i all i've known out of there is like spotted bass came out of there um yeah. that but that's we, it, like we would fish it for the tech fishing team occasionally really? we'd have our club tournaments there just because it's only about 35 minutes away you know that it's sucks. our closest lake and it, it it stinks yeah it's just not a great fishery it the fishing pressure there is very high, actually. Oh, yeah. I mean, very high. And it's a it, it doesn't fish big because it's just pretty much a river system. With you know, one there arm. Are, with one <laughs> arm. Yeah. So it does it doesn't fish big, a lot of fishing pressure, a lot of little Kentucky spots that kinda just yeah. I mean it it yeah, not one of the best lakes in Virginia, which is just strange because the New River is such an incredible fishery. So yeah. just like you'd think if you threw a dam on it and made a lake, you know, it would be real good. But that's not the case. That's so. what's so fascinating. I fished and vacation there as a kid at Clear Lake and the fishing sucks. I mean, it just does. And and it's like, well, the smallmouth fishing is banging above it and below it. But in the lake, it's just spotted bass. And but then I don't see a lot of people posting pictures of spotted bass caught in the New River proper. It seems like no. it's really Clater Lake, which is weird. That is kind of weird. You know, the state now has pictures at just about every ramp. It's like, this is an Alabama bass. If you catch one, you know, get rid of it. And I mean, I might guide like 150 days a year and we might catch six, seven spots a year, maybe. And like, most That's of them are pretty obviously Kentuckys. And then the, maybe there'll be like two where I'm like, this might be in Alabama. But yeah, so just hmm. not really, I mean, out of thousands and thousands and thousands of smallmouth caught, you know, just maybe. And same with largemouth. You know, I probably catch less than 10 spots and less than 10 largemouth every year. That's... Yeah. Damn, that's insane. Is there any trout fishing that, or any guiding that you do? Maybe it's not trout between October and let's say, you know, springtime conditions in March. Not really. We, uh, we do musky trips at our outfitter. Um, we did not last year just cause the flows were so low all winter. You kind of want high water for musky fishing, but no, I pretty much just do, do bass from like March to November. Oh, wow. Yep. That's yep. Okay. Uh, and the last thing with the tournament, and then we can put a pin on that is, and this actually just goes with the fishing report too. If, if people wanted to come down there, what are generically your top three baits that you'd be throwing this time of year? Uh, this time of year on a guide trip, we usually, I usually kind of swing for the fences early with the top water, some sort of, I throw a lot of whopper ploppers or choppos, you know, just cause buzz baits work, you know, but I mean, I get people that, I mean, I get people that have like never fished before all the way to like very experienced fishermen. So I like using the whopper plopper, you know, just cause you throw it out there and reel it in, you know? So I use a lot of those, a lot of walking baits, usually, you know, when the heat of the day kind of sets in Ned rigs, Senkos. Um, and I tell people this time of year and I see it so much. I say like the fishing this time of year is almost like duck, duck goose with those baits, you know, cause it'll be like nine incher, 13 incher, 11 incher. And you have to go through tons of those fish. And then all of a sudden you'll set the hook and be like, Oh man, this is a big one. But what I see a lot with my clients is they'll catch 40 fish on the worm that are all small. 
and they'll kind of get lazier and lazier with each hook set and each retrieve, you know, and then fish number 41 is like a 21 incher and they mm -hmm. give it like kind of like a half hook set comes up, throws the bait and they're like, Oh no. And I'm like, ah, so yeah, usually top water in the morning, worms in the middle of the day. If we've caught a ton of fish and not really a big one, I might start looking at like, I mean, I like throwing flukes a lot too. That tends to be a pretty nice a good glide baits, fish bait. glide baits. Um, yeah, but I mean, if it's high water any time of year, like if the water comes up, it's all about a crankbait, a spinnerbait, a chatterbait. Um, had a really good day on the chatterbait last week when the river was pretty high. So, I mean, it's just all sorts of things. With smallmouth, do you prefer, if you had your, your pick, throwing a single hook or a treble hook? Because I think of like a crankbait versus a chatterbait, something like that. I've seen sometimes they hit the chatterbait so damn hard and they just don't get a hook in them. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Spinnerbait and chatterbait, I mean, yeah, in my kind of experience on a spinnerbait or chatterbait, if it hits it and you give it a good hook set, like you've got it, you know, and sometimes with treble baits, it's like they hit it, me or the client or whoever's fishing does nothing wrong, you know, like fights it really well rod tip down when the fish comes up and they just come off you know so i don't know there's just different differences to all all sorts of fishing i just with the ned rig that we're throwing a lot this time of year i throw just the heaviest head a lot of the time and some of the really deep holes you know and the the hookup ratio on those just sign seems to be tough kind of because it's such a small hook and such a big weight that's shaking around you know so yeah it's just all about you know i try to tell my clients and they're always like oh yeah i will but then you know inevitably they start kind of backsliding a little bit it's just keeping that mentality that your next fish might be a 20 incher no matter if your last 20 fish were 10 inches you know mm. so yeah you're a river rat Tube versus Ned Rig. Where are you on that cultish debate? Oh, so I pretty much throw a tube all spring. March. I mean, the tube like is like my I mean, it's a it's a fish catching thing in in the winter, you know, in the winter in December, January, I'm almost exclusively throwing a tube. Hmm. You know, as my only bait, you know. And then in the spring, when it starts, you know heating up a little bit the tube is definitely my go-to jig you know but i might start fishing a jerk bait and crank bait a little more and then kind of as the year rolls on i go to the ned rig in the summer and it's just kind of mainly because um the, the flows just decrease you know so in the spring i'm throwing like a quarter or a three eighth ounce tube you know and obviously they don't make they don't make a Ned rig head that heavy. Um, I'll talk to you after the, the show. I got something. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they do. But uh, <laughs> in the summertime, when the flows are real low, even like a quarter ounce tube tends to get snagged all the time. And an eighth ounce tube, I've tried it, and it just doesn't seem to do as well as the Ned rig in the summer. But so, yeah, pretty much cold water months, I'm on the tube. Warm water months, I'm on the Ned rig. So. Hmm. I, yeah. I just, that to me is like, you take 10 people to look at a painting and they're all going to give you a different answer. I just think that's so fascinating with all the river rats I have on this show. Everyone has their own stupid opinion about those two things. And to me, it's like, they're so close together. They're just so similar, but yeah. yet people are so religious about when it works. And it's just, it's fascinating. <laughs> well, really my, yeah, kind of what I think of it as is, I mean, my favorite time to fish kind of is the winter and the spring. And in the, the, I was telling you earlier how hard the new river flows in the winter time. I really like fishing a really heavy tube because it gets down on the bottom and it's so heavy that the current isn't moving it across the bottom. Really like you're moving it with your rod, but it's too heavy for the current to move. And when you think about wintertime fish that are real lethargic, you know, if the current is moving that bait pretty quick, they're not moving fast enough to be like, oh, I, you know, I'm going to go chase that thing. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So I really, in the winter, like a heavy tube that sinks to the bottom without drifting at all. And then you can work it just a little bit, you know. But in the summertime, it almost seems like the fish set up in the faster moving current and like a bait that's getting swept across the bottom a little bit, like a lighter net rig. I totally believe that. Um, you really, I think people that fly fish at all really have a better time in the summertime fishing for smallmouth things like that. They understand the drift and setting it up so it flows naturally. Versus, I feel like you can get away with more bass pitching and flipping seams and stuff in the winter time where you want it to just sit. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a mistake I see a lot of people make. Is in the summertime this time of year, you really want your bait to just drift with the current. And I'll have people say throwing a wacky or something that are throwing just way too much action into it. You know, I'm like, just get it over there in that current and let the current do its thing, you know, cause that's what looks the most natural to, to the fish. Dude, I, I really can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, is there anything that we can plug for you that we put in the episode description, especially you know, the guide service? Um, yeah, just the guide service, New River Outdoor Company. Um, you just mentioned fly fishing. We do fly fishing trips. That's something oh, cool. we really didn't get into. Um, that that gizmo cicada bite that Nolan got on last year at the Susquehanna. You know, I'd never thrown the gizmo, but I, I told him before the tournament, I was like, some of the, the biggest fish we catch in the summer are on my fly fishing trips when we throw this little cicada fly. So then he was able to find that bait and kind of replicate it. But yeah. Um, How did you get a, on that? Oh, uh, that's something that Britt has done forever. You know, that he, uh, he kind of taught me. Um, was that because of Brood X? Um, no. So we have annual cicadas here every year. Um, so the Brood X every 17 years, there's a ton of cicadas. And that was actually here about three years ago. But uh, every year we still have quite a few cicadas. And uh, the cicada bite is really good. I mean, you just drift that little cicada fly under overhanging branches and it, it seems to be real good. So if you're a fly fisherman, you know, we offer that. And then the summertime is really fun. Good time for kids to get out here catching a lot of fish. The numbers have been really good recently. And then uh, the fall can be really fun too. But then, like I have said, my favorite time is the spring. You know, that's when we catch most of our biggest fish, I think. Me and my clients had about 70 citations this spring, you know, 15, five pounders. So, I mean, if, if, if you're looking for that 20 plus or that five plus, you know, the springtime is probably the best time to come. But yeah, New River Outdoor Company, look us up. Um, yeah, we'll get you out here on the New River. When will you ever start fishing tournaments again? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I still like... I still would. I've got buddies that do, you know, I, I don't think I'm ever really going to get into fishing tournaments, all that. I mean, as like a boater, but I'd still, if, if, say what if about no kayaks? One, uh, I don't know. I, I, there's a kayak tournament group around here and, uh, I don't know. I just feel like if I showed up, <laughs> I feel like you're guy, staring at a gun right now. <laughs> like no, I just, the camera. <laughs> just like, I just kind of felt like, I thought that would be fun, but then I would just feel like if they found out, they're like, oh, you're out here every single day, you know, as a guy, you know, I'm just not sure if they would like that or not. So I haven't, I haven't been fishing many kayak tournaments here. Tournament fit. It is so hard from my limited experience, just so how many people I've talked to, it's hard to guide and try to be a tournament angler. It's really hard. The, the people that I know that truly are really good at guiding, that's all they do and like the Chris yeah. Gorsuch's of the world the people that have been doing this forever it's like their whole purpose in life is to guide the people that try to split it it's it's hard it's really yeah hard. yeah it is hard like Nolan was telling me I should do this tournament here this week and I was like <laughs> I don't know I just feel like it's like a lose-lose situation you know like if if I do really well or win people would be like oh well, it's because he's a guide here and if I didn't do very well people would be like he's a guide here and we all beat him, you know? So it's just kind of, it's a weird situation to be in. What if, what if you could go up to like the Susquehanna? Oh, I think that'd be more fair game, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I might maybe sometime in the future if they go, well, I'm sure they'll go back there. When they go back there, I might have I'll to go back into that. All right, cool. I'll hold you to that. We'll, we'll try to get you into a tournament, get you to, to blow out the, the rust again. But no, Ethan, again, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate that. I was finally able to get you on the show. Again, guys, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. Link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Please go book a guided trip with him. Uh, it would be a fun experience. The New River is a really cool place that I think more people need just to be aware of. It is kind of a drive for, for, for a lot of people, but it's still a fun experience. And uh, we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.